Hello, I'm Monse Alvarado, and this is EWTN News In-Depth. More countries around the world and individual states in America make a push to legalize euthanasia and assisted suicide. We travel to Europe to see a compassionate alternative and get the Catholic perspective from some powerful voices. People say that uh, with, if you leave one eye on the future, on your death, it makes you live your life now much more intensely and much more seriously because uh, you're, you're aware of what your decisions lead to. Giving meaning to suffering and death, Archbishop Charles Chaput challenges us to shake up our Christian lives to make them worth living. The Supreme Court rules in favor of removing COVID restrictions on home worship in California. Expert insight on that and what a newly announced presidential commission might mean for the court's future. We're not a perfect parish in any way, shape or form, but we're a really good parish. When somebody has a need, we step up. What goes into making a strong Catholic parish? We're in the community talking to priests and parishioners to find the answer. And a Syrian refugee shares his journey, leaving a shattered country behind and following his faith to his new home. EWTN News In Depth is next. A month ago, I was given the death sentence. An elderly Spanish woman says she was doomed until she received compassionate care. Her gratitude for life is in stark contrast to the rising pressure for governments around the globe to legalize euthanasia and doctor-assisted suicide for the terminally ill. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. Around the world, from Europe to Australia, and in many parts of the United States, voices are growing louder in secular society to legally shield doctors and other medical professionals who participate in their patients' suicides. Just one month ago, after contentious debate, lawmakers in the Spanish parliament voted to legalize euthanasia with a 61-vote majority. The law was met with condemnation from the Spanish Catholic Church. Spain's vote marks the first time in Europe a euthanasia law has been enacted in a predominantly Catholic country, where there has traditionally been a strong culture of life. With that in mind, EWTN News In Depth wanted to know what people in Spanish palliative care centers devoted to honoring the dignity of life thought about the new law. From EWTN Spain, Sofia Ruiz del Cueto reports. At the palliative care hospital Laguna Via Norte, respect for human life and a peaceful death are the cornerstones of the facility. Pilar Campos has been working with the patients for eight years. I only remember one case in eight years that once the pain was gone, the patient kept asking for the injection. He asked for it the first day, but the second day he never brought it up again and never wanted to talk about it again. And at Laguna Via Norte Hospital, Palliative care stands not only as an alternative to euthanasia, but as basic end-of-life care that they say everyone should have access to. If you are in extreme pain or suffering, you want it to end. But if that can be accompanied and alleviated in some way, those requests for euthanasia are greatly reduced. Our statement would be quality palliative care for all. They brought me here, and I thank God the moment they did. <laughs> the president of the Spanish government, Pedro Sánchez, commented on the law in a tweet, saying that Spain is now a more humane, fairer, and freer country. But Blanca Flor González, who will turn 88 this June, says that she enjoys every minute of her life in spite of her failing health. Blessed be God, I came back to life. I have come back to life because the doctors told my daughter this is over. And then they brought me from the hospital on October 12th to here. And I don't know what they may have done or not have done to me, but what I do know is I'm still alive. Palliative care professionals say if the patient is lonely and depressed, that can be treated with medicine, love, and attention. Blanca's daughter reveals she had a terrible conception of palliative care, but after a few days in Laguna Hospital, she has totally changed her mind. 
I would say, I would like to die like this. The new law allows doctors and nursing staff to refuse to assist in euthanasia if it does not correspond to their beliefs. Today, euthanasia is legal in the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg and Canada. And at the end of January, the Portuguese parliament also passed a law on euthanasia, but the country's president blocked the decision. In France, a bill to institute euthanasia is now being debated. While in Spain, the law takes effect in June, Catholic bishops have condemned the legalization of euthanasia. Sofia Ruiz del Cueto in Madrid for EWTN News in Depth. As we just learned, euthanasia, or doctor-assisted suicide, which is the deliberate ending of life by a doctor by administering lethal drugs, is now legal in several countries. And here's a fuller list to include assisted suicide in which the patient can self-administer lethal medications under the supervision of a doctor or with a prescription. Those countries include Australia, where one state out of six allows euthanasia and another allows assisted suicide, Belgium, Canada, Colombia, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Spain, and as we just heard in our lead report, and Switzerland. The legalization of assisted suicide in the United States is growing, with legislation pending in many more states to make it even more far-reaching. Currently, it is legal in California, Colorado, Hawaii, Maine, New Mexico, New Jersey, Oregon, Vermont, Washington State, and Washington, D.C. New Mexico's new law was passed just last week and goes into effect in June. It is the second state after New Jersey, with a third or more of its population identifying as Catholic to legalize assisted suicide. The Catholic Church teaching tells us the legalization of assisted suicide in euthanasia contradict the dignity of human life. The elderly, the sick, and those with disabilities are particularly vulnerable. Our catechism says an act or a mission that causes death in order to eliminate suffering constitutes a murder gravely contrary to the dignity of the human person and to the respect due to the living God, his creator. To give us a better understanding of church teaching on this matter and the perspectives from those working on the forefront of this issue, we're joined now by Sister Constance Veet, the Communications Director for the Communities of the Little Sisters of the Poor in Washington, D.C., Skylar Kovich, disabilities advocate and scholar. His published writings about assisted suicide have appeared in the Journal of Public Affairs and the Society of St. Sebastian, and Matthew Bunsen, EWTN News Executive Editor and Washington Bureau Chief. Thank you so much for joining us. Sister Constance to you. We just heard this story of Blanca, an elderly woman in Spain whose daughter did not believe in palliative care, but changed her mind when she saw it save her mother's life. Do you see this often in your work with the Little Sisters of the Poor, where you help the elderly poor and dying? Well, uh, thank you for having me, Monty. Um, I think here in the United States, perhaps there's a better understanding of palliative care, but we do see families who sometimes fear that by not um, having their elderly relative go to the hospital so that everything possible can be done, that they might be violating Catholic teaching. And so at times we do have to explain palliative care to them and make it clear that it's not uh, aimed at ending their lives and that it, you know it's, it's aimed at making them comfortable for whatever time and whatever life they have left. And you have homes around the globe, right? Yes, we do. Skylar, let's follow up on that. You're a prominent scholar and a voice on euthanasia and assisted suicide, but you're also a personal advocate for disability rights. Can you tell us more about your battle fighting for your rights? Uh, so I've been totally blind since birth, and uh, I will admit I don't have the kind of severe medical challenges that we're mainly talking about here. But one of the main concerns of disability rights advocates across the political spectrum is that once even a very limited legalization happens, there starts to be calls for even broader eligibility uh, for uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide, even including people with mental illnesses and, and uh, other struggles that it was not originally intended for. Now, as a Catholic, I converted in college uh, largely because of the theology and social teaching. I don't agree with legalization entirely. But sometimes uh, some of the other arguments uh, can be able to reach different legislators and different people. So, like, for example, in Canada, uh, 
one of the left-wing parties, the New Democrats, has actually worked with the conservatives to try unsuccessfully to stop uh, assisted suicide. And so I'm really interested in that coalition building work. And uh, you know, we want to make it clear that we do not want to be seen as burdens by others or by ourselves. That's right. You want to cross the aisle. Talking about those trends that you brought up in Canada, Matthew, what does the growing trend of legalization of assisted suicide in the U.S. say about how first principles are eroding in our country and how we're copycats of other countries? Well, we're not just copycats. Uh, in some ways now we're pathfinders uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is uh, in this type of consumerist uh, uh, culture that we have now, uh, that really we're seeing a decline in the recognition of the dignity of the human person. Uh, we can go back to some of the core problems created uh, in our culture, both politically and, and elsewhere, uh, by the rise of abortion, by the legalization of abortion, just as exactly what was warned uh, would happen. And we can even go back to the legalization and the promotion of a contraceptive culture. And the, you other, the other thing that we're looking at, though, is a, a, a decrease in hope. Uh, that people are being pushed into despair uh, because of a lack of religious sense. Uh, but the other thing, too, is the development or rise of what Pope Francis calls a throwaway culture, uh, that the human being is disposable, especially those who are sick, elderly, or have disabilities. And we talk, let's go back to something Kyler, Sky, Skyler said. We talk about this issue of crossing the aisle, the NDP in Canada crossing the aisle to, f to fight for disability rights. Do you see a possibility for that here on the assisted suicide issue? Well, our hope is uh, that as the situation continues to deteriorate and the results of this uh, look more and more like what we're seeing in Europe in places like the Netherlands and Belgium and elsewhere, uh, that sensible people uh, on both political sides of the aisle are going to, to realize uh, that something has to be done here uh, to preserve life because this is uh, the slippery slope, as they say, is very slippery indeed where this is concerned. And it causes us to have to stand up for our rights. Sister Constance, you fought for exemption rights for the Little Sisters of the Poor uh, on the contraceptive mandate. Why is that important here, the importance of protecting your rights? Well, because for us Little Sisters of the Poor, we absolutely value and reverence the dignity of each person and each elderly person's life. And so... You know, if we were to be forced into a situation where we were required to cooperate with those who wanted um, assisted suicide, we it would be mission ending for us. You know, I live in D.C. and I actually attended the hearing when the vote was taken to legalize assisted suicide. And if we were not exempt, um, if we were forced to participate in that, um, it's just unthinkable to us as as Catholic women consecrated to Jesus Christ, that that we would participate in taking the lives of those whom we love and care for. And especially now when your ministry is so important with the impacts of COVID, fear, yes. isolation, pain, are they making the legalization of euthanasia even more dangerous now? The effects of the pandemic? Yes. Um, I think perhaps, um, although I, I've been finding that the whole emphasis, it seems, toward long-term care is on preserving life and, at times, um, preserving the physical life of the elderly. I think there's a lot of worries about liabilities and being sued and things like that. So uh, it's not a holistic viewpoint, though. You know, everything is being done to keep the elderly and the frail from being infected with the virus without really... Um, helping to make sure that they still have quality of life. So we're in a little bit of a, of a difficult situation from that perspective. Great. Skylar, can you explain some of the political strategy around this, the frequency of the introduction of state-level bills? Does that increase the, the ability of us to have a federal mandate on this? Uh, there have been some attempts to... Uh legalized assisted suicide federally. They fortunately have not gone very far. Uh, there, as with what I mentioned with the left-wing parties in other countries, there still are some Democrats who uh, don't agree with assisted suicide here in the U.S. Uh, they are just decreasing in number, uh, which is part of what allowed the uh, legalization in New Mexico uh, to happen, where uh, fewer Democrats uh, crossed the aisle to vote against it. Uh, there are definitely lots of, uh, as I said, groups working across coalitions, including uh, disability rights groups, 
like Not Dead Yet, as well as uh, uh, Catholic and other Christian groups. And uh, uh, there's definitely still many legislators who are uh, open to uh, seeing the perspectives of what the problems are with assisted suicide, but it, it's uh, a very difficult fight in many states, and uh, especially in Connecticut. Uh, any listeners there should be watching out for uh, a bill that just got out of committee and trying to uh, call their state legislators against that. We'll make sure that we watch out for that as well. Sister Constance, Pope Francis talks about finding joy in the, in the elderly and knowing our family history. How is this issue at the heart of what Catholics believe about life? Well, I think that, um, you know, there's always, there's always something positive in life. There's always joy in life. Life is a gift. And just the fact that each day we wake up and are breathing and still alive, even though we may be in a state of frailty, uh, is proof of God's love for us. And that really is at the heart of, of a joy that no one can take away from us, knowing that we are loved by God no matter what. And so when we also are able to surround the frail with love and care and tenderness, as our Holy Father speaks so often of, of tenderness, you know, a revolution of tenderness, that again is a source of, of jo great joy for them. But it all starts with God's love for each person. Thank you so much, Sister, Scott, Sister Constance and Skylar and Matthew. We'll keep up with these changes on this issue and continue our in-depth coverage. It really is a very healthy way of living with joy if we have one eye focused on our future and our future, God's plan for our future course is having and joy with Him. Things worth dying for, thoughts on a life worth living. Archbishop Charles Chaput shares his insight and wisdom up next. Welcome back to EWTN News In Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. The Easter season calls us to reflect on Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and the promise of life after death. In Archbishop Charles Chaput's latest book, we're given a beautiful meditation on the meaning of suffering and the importance of keeping one eye focused on our future with our Savior. Former Archbishop Charles Chaput is on the record. Archbishop Chaput, thank you so much for joining us. I just finished reading your incredible book, Things Worth Dying For, uh, which just came out, and I'm grateful that you made the time to come on and chat with us about it. Uh, you start Well, thank off... you very much for paying attention to the book. I'm absolutely, grateful. absolutely. You start off the book discussing Jewish ancestry within the Catholic Church and the importance of memory, this concept, right? Why do you use the term memory and not just history? Well, memory is much more personal. It's kind of a living thing within us. It drives us and motivates us. Uh, history is more objective and not nearly as interesting. Uh, I think memories are our personal history, and we're much more attached to that than general history. A personal history. In terms of our humanity, we all know that we are finite here on Earth, and you explain in your book how, how death is what gives your life meaning. Why was it so important to reflect on the meaning of death for Catholics? Well, it's been a long, long tradition in the Catholic Church. Uh, that people say that uh, it, with, if you leave one eye on the future, on your death, it makes you live your life now much more intensely and much more seriously because uh, you're, you're aware of what your decisions lead to. So I think it really is a very healthy way of living with joy if we have one eye focused on our future and our future, God's plan for our future course is having and joy with Him. We were chatting a little bit earlier about how it took a while to get to the joy in the book when we were reflecting on death because it does, you know, it, it forces us to think about these, these uh, you know, very difficult questions about our life. Um, why did you choose that theme? Well, I think uh, one of the important uh, issues when you're retired and you're in, uh, heading towards the end of your life is to ask, what were the most important things? Uh, what really was worth living for? What, what do you love more than life itself? And who do you love more than yourself? And all of that kind of leads to a reflection on our, our future with God after our present life. And I think really leads us to commit ourselves to live our lives well. Uh, so death, for, for Christians who are really believers, it's sad, but it's not terribly sad because it's the step into the future that God has planned for us. It's relevant that we're talking about this uh, the week of Easter when we're so focused on the resurrection. 
you you're known for talking about politics. You're not shy to engage in the political discourse. The Capitol riots in January were an example of what you call the nationalism versus patriotism. How has patriotism changed throughout your lifetime? When, when I was a young boy, it was an honorable and uh, important thing to be patriotic. As time has gone on, especially since uh, after the Vietnam War, I think patriotism has a less favorable um, place in people's minds and hearts. But I think it's important for us to, to love our neighbors enough to be willing to live for them and actually die for our country as long as it's in a good cause. Uh, so I think patriotism is, is a virtue. It's a it's a response to the fourth commandment, uh, loving our parents, but expanding that to the broader family that is our, our national family. I love that. I love that kind of very different description of duty um, to, to our country. On the year of St. Joseph, which the Pope has declared, why is it so important to remember St. Joseph and who he was and what he did in calming this obsession that we have with science? Well, well St. Joseph is the patron of the church, of course, and in a special way the patron of fathers because he was the foster father of Jesus. And uh, our understanding of him is based on very little because we only have a few words about him in scripture, but he comes across as a very calm and, and focused man who was willing to give everything, uh, in, including his total self to God's plan. And uh, if we're willing to do that, it changes our engagement with the world around us and makes us better fathers and and mothers and brothers and sisters and children in our families. So St. Joseph is a great model and patron for all of us these days. Was there something important about what he did, the fact that he was a carpenter? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that uh, Jesus followed in his footsteps, and uh, it's also interesting that the cross is made of wood. So in some ways, you, you can use your imagination to... Uh, picture that God planned this uh, so that Jesus would be preparing himself, molding himself for the uh, future on the cross, which led to our redemption. Uh, so I, I think St. Joseph uh, taught Jesus how to work and how to love, and we can learn from their relationship the same thing in our lives. You point out that it's important for the Catholic Church to recognize the sins of the past. You label a, a bunch of different crises that the church has had over the, you know, the many generations. Can you expand on that, why recognizing the sins of the past is so important? Well, well I, I learned that from Pope John Paul II, St. Pope John Paul II, who um, at, uh, towards the end of the Jubilee year uh, listed all the sins of the church and asked forgiveness for those. Um, I think that the way you begin to grow in holiness is to stand on top of your sins and decide to do something different. And there's no way of doing that unless you really know your sins. So knowing our sins, and that's why we go to confession so we remember them, is the beginning point from leaping into a future that's much better. And uh, we need to do that as individuals, but we also need to do that as a church community because we have a, a lot of sins in our communal past that we need to be sorry for and then grow from into better people. That takes a lot of courage. Um, you say in your book that Christianity lived properly is never a quiet presence in any society. It always has public implications. That's a direct quote from your book, and I, that meant a lot to me. What, is, what does that mean? How does that affect how we should be living our Christianity, our Catholicity? Well, I, I'm, I'm always reminding people that uh, Jesus was nailed to the cross for a reason, and the reason for it is that he was upsetting to those who were in power around him. What he said and what he did somehow shook the foundation of uh, the present order because Jesus was trying, to st was trying to create a new order more in line with the order of creation that was planned by God the Father. Uh, and if we live our own lives as Christians, following the example of Jesus, then we uh, sometimes will shake the order around us and disturb people who don't want to be disturbed and that can lead to us being uh, persecuted or at least being unpopular. We don't like that to happen. We don't want to be unpopular, so we're tempted not to follow the gospel. But if we do, it shakes up our, ourselves, first of all, but then it shakes up the world around us. Well, you definitely shake up the world. Um, and in your book, you have a lot of big words. <laughs> there was one big word in particular that stood out to me, ecclesiolatry. And the emphasis that some church leaders put on titles and other kinds of honorifics, is that part of a growing issue in the church? Well, I, th I think it's something we should pay attention to. I, I, uh, 
ecclesiolatry is uh, idol worship of the church, worshiping the church in an inappropriate way. The only uh, being uh, worthy of worship is the supreme being is God. And it's important for us to love the church as our mother, but not to, to commit the sin of idolatry by not acknowledging the church has weaknesses and sins, as well as being the, the source of our spiritual life. Uh, so I think it's important to keep all things in perspective. In terms of uh, the, you know, we can get caught up in forms in the church, uh, forms that really don't uh, match the need of our times, and which sometimes stand in, in uh, contradiction to the gospel. For example, this is just my own personal uh, thought, but, you know, to call bishops your excellency is kind of a strange thing, because that, that comes from uh, medieval Renaissance times when people use those kind of forms of address when speaking to people. I don't think that uh, the early church called Peter your holiness or the apostles your excellencies. They actually referred to them by their names. And I think that uh, once uh, a bishop, for example, begins to think that he's excellent, that's pretty dangerous because <laughs> we're, we're, we're not. We're, we're sinners like the rest of uh, humanity and we're baptized Christians before we're bishops. Now, I think it's important to have respect for the office of bishops. I, don't, I certainly don't want to encourage people not to do that. But, you know, we're all members of the church. We're re co-responsible for the church. And we should uh, treat our bishops in a way that recognizes their humanity and also honors the fact that they do succeed to the responsibilities of the apostles. Now, the apostles were messed up much of the time. You know, they all fled <laughs> except, for, except for St. John. And it could be that the, the bishops are in the same boat in fact, historically, it seems to be the case, but uh, we still, at the same time, need to honor the structure of the church and the responsibility and authority of those that uh, the, the Jesus has given us as our shepherds. And we are all part of one family. You, you talk in your book about the importance of supporting the family, and it was a very personal focus for you. Are the discussions in Congress about policy that supports family a sign of hope for you? Yes, I think it's important that we do that all the time, and not just occasionally. And it also means supporting the family from the moment of conception through natural death. So uh, natural death. So, you know, things like abortion and euthanasia really do undermine family life and the Catholic understanding of what it means to be a family. So, uh, you know, giving support to uh, mothers and children is very, very important. You know, it, uh, to encourage people to have children and to marriage and live responsible family lives is so very important. But it's also important to respect life from the very beginning to the very end. And that used to be something that was taught in family and in the institutional structure of the church. A Gallup poll released last month shows that Americans' membership in houses of worship has dropped below 50 percent for the first time in 80 years. That Gallup has been conducting this survey that long. You talk about this in your book. What does this mean to the church, that lack of institutional affiliation? Well, I think it's, it's much worse for Catholics than the national average now. You know, it used to be, back when I was very much younger, that the Catholic participation in church life was around 75 percent and certainly higher, much higher than the, our Protestant brothers and sisters and, and other groups. And now the Catholic participation is lower than our Protestant brothers and sisters and other groups. And that's really sad because external commitment to a community does reflect internal commitment to uh, what the community stands for. There's no way we can be a good Christian by ourselves. We need the community of the church. We need the sacramental order of things to really live, live good Catholic lives. And so when we see a diminishment of Catholic participation in the life of church, that's something to be very, very worried about. My last question is a personal one for you. As a single person in the church and someone who really values friendship, friendship and community, you say, is, is vital for us and we were built for it. Are we losing the ability to love one another as God, God calls us, as, as neighbors and friends, or, or is there something hopeful to the end of your book when you talk about friendship? Well, you know, I think there's a lot of cynicism around friendship these days. People don't really sometimes believe it's possible. They think all relationships are about self-interest rather than in self-forgetfulness. And uh, Jesus, by his words, taught us that friendship means a willingness to lay down our lives, which isn't uh, a formality, and it's not superficial. Uh, it, it means that we really are called to, to love our neighbors more than we love ourselves. And uh, if, if we did that faithfully in our real relationships, friendship would see a, a rebirth to a different level, uh, and it would be a, a source of great support in our desire to live our Catholic life together as a community. 
Well, I hope that more people will be inspired by your book the way that, that I am and, and the way that I've been inspired by your witness. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and God bless your program and all that you're about. Thank you so much. We wanted to take a moment to wish a very special happy birthday to Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, who turned 94 this week. Born Joseph Ratzinger in Germany, Ratzinger became a priest in 1951. Before his election as pope in 2005, he served for 24 years as prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. He stepped down in 2013, becoming the first pope to do so in almost 600 years. Pope Benedict is now the first person to ever have been pope who has reached the age of 94. A very happy birthday. EWTN News In Depth will be right back. It's one thing to sit in church and listen to a homily, listen to scripture. There's another thing to take that out and put it in the field and make it work. Building a strong church that serves its community. Some advice from people rolling up their sleeves and making it happen. What makes for a rich parish life? Why are so many parishes so successful in building their church communities? We asked reporter Mark Irons to go on assignment and get some answers as EWTN News In Depth explores this Catholic life. What makes a good faith community, a good Catholic parish? It's not always perfect. We're not a perfect parish in any way, shape or form, but we're a really good parish. When somebody has a need, we step up. St. Gabriel Church outside Baltimore saw an immediate need and the opportunity to feed the hungry those struggling with financial hardship during the pandemic. Parishioner Maureen Kelly told me why she's compelled to volunteer. Yeah, spirituality is a huge part of this because I'm called by God to serve him. So my service is this. Monsignor Thomas Phillips says parishioners are taking the message they hear on Sundays to heart. How we can put the gospel into practice here, really. There's a connection between listening and the action that follows. It's one thing to sit in church and listen to a homily, and listen to scripture. There's another thing to take that out and put it in the field and make it work, and that's what's happening here. In Arlington, Virginia, St. Charles Church is also actively living out its spiritual mandate. We're all about the mission of bringing the good news of the gospel here to the heart of Arlington and doing it together. We genuinely enjoy each other's company and love working together. Father Don Planty is pastor here. Many of the people in the pews are young adults who are really serious about their faith and really looking to not just go through the motions on Sunday. But Parishioners like Rohit Fonseca and Bulai Mignana are involved in smaller communities within the greater parish, like prayer or social groups. In my experience, it's most of the time, it's friendship that, that brings people closer to God. Forming relationships with one another, working to build up the life of the church. The church is a family. Simone Rizkala with Endow, a group helping to bring Catholic women together in parish communities, says a good church family, a parish, will first be rooted in the most important relationship, one with Jesus, and that starts with prayer. We need to become what John Paul II said, schools of prayer, that parishes would become schools of prayer. Everyone kept coming back to this central theme of prayer, including Father Thomas Ferguson at Good Shepherd Parish in Alexandria, Virginia. I personally like to encourage people in preaching to really be attentive to their daily prayer and how God is calling us all to a deeper relationship through daily prayer. The emphasis on prayer inspiring more action, people hearing and following God's call to give in different ways. There's a strong emphasis on feeding the hungry at this parish. This pile of groceries isn't collected for an annual or monthly food drive. Parishioners are dropping off groceries here every Sunday before Mass. And if you aren't sure how you're being called to serve, you might start with asking your priest how you can contribute. That is music to a pastor's ears. I mean, there's always more stuff to be done. The group Amazing Parish works to build up priests through coaching and support. The director, Kevin Cotter, says a good parish starts with good leadership, and a good leader needs the backing of his people. Where a priest knows these people aren't just here to tell me what to do. They're not just here to say, yeah, I'll pray for you, Father. But they're actually here for him as a person. And Father Planty says his leadership starts with spending time in prayer with Jesus. If I blow him off, I see the difference in my life. I can't, I can't live without that time I spend with him. 
Maureen Kelly shared a similar thought. You have to be able to listen. You have to listen to what God says. That means spending time in quiet. And she says a spirit of gratitude will move you to love others. Arts, our greatest gift is to give back to God what he's given to us. Mark Irons, EWTN News In-Depth. Thank you for that, Mark. And for more from EWTN News In-Depth, we invite you to connect with us on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. This Week in Review is next. An end is in sight to America's longest war, and the president announces a commission on Supreme Court reform. We'll take a deep dive ahead. And later, we introduce you to a Syrian journalist whose faith gave him the courage to start a new life. And we take you to a shrine in Italy famed for Marian apparitions. Beautiful images from this Roman grotto ahead. The end of America's longest war tops this week in review. The Biden administration has announced the U.S. will bring the Afghanistan war to a close and will withdraw all American troops by September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on America. The conflict has taken the lives of more than 2,200 U.S. troops, wounded 20,000 and cost trillions of dollars. Critics of the president's decision are many, including the Taliban, which threatens to attack any U.S. forces left in the country past May 1st, the date the Trump administration had negotiated full withdrawal. Many lawmakers and military officials are also unhappy with the move, saying complete departure was, will spark more terrorist activity. But Biden said it's time for American troops to come home, and 20 years is enough. I also know there are many who argue that we should stay stay fighting in Afghanistan because withdrawal would damage America's credibility and weaken America's influence in the world. I believe the exact opposite is true. We went to Afghanistan because of a horrific attack that happened 20 years ago. That cannot explain why we should remain there in 2021. After his White House address, President Biden traveled to Arlington National Cemetery to visit Section 60, where dead from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars are buried. He paid tribute to the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who have given their lives during what many have called the endless war. The city of Indianapolis is reeling today after a mass shooting at a FedEx facility late Thursday evening. Eight people are dead and several others wounded after a gunman randomly shot people in the parking lot before entering the building. The gunman then died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Investigators are working to establish a motive. Tensions are high around the country after more high-profile fatal police shootings. In Chicago, a 13-year-old boy was shot and killed during a police foot chase. In police body cam video released late this week, Adam Toledo is seen throwing away what appears to be a gun seconds before he was shot. The police officer involved is now on administrative leave, and the city is preparing for potential civil unrest. That follows the shooting last weekend of 20-year-old Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, during a traffic stop and attempted arrest. Now, former police officer Kim Potter has been charged with second-degree manslaughter. The shooting has sparked nightly protests in the Minnesota town, which is just 10 miles from the courthouse where the Derek Chauvin trial is being held. He is the former Minneapolis police officer accused of murdering George Floyd. Defense attorneys for Chauvin have rested their case. Closing arguments begin on Monday. Invoking his Fifth Amendment right not to testify, Chauvin chose not to take the stand. Meantime, contradicting the prosecution's expert who said Floyd died from a lack of oxygen after being pinned down, the defense expert said he thought Floyd died from an underlying heart condition. In my opinion, Mr. Floyd had a sudden cardiac arrhythmia or cardiac arrhythmia due to his atherosclerotic and hypertensive heart disease, or you can write that down multiple different ways. The defense expert also expressed his opinion that illegal drugs, including fentanyl and methamphetamine, were contributing factors to Floyd's death. Medical researchers are still investigating whether blood clotting is related to COVID vaccinations. While they study six known cases in which women experience clots, the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine is on hold. The FDA and Centers for Disease Control said the women developed blood clots within 6 to 13 days after receiving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. 
all were between the ages of 18 and 48. One woman died, another remains in serious condition. Almost 7 million doses of J&J &J vaccine have been administered in the United States, the vast majority with no side effects. It's less than one in a million, and we know that even, you know, when we talk about vaccines overall, uh, the idea of one in a million sort of rare side effect is, is usually what is, what is quoted. Um, but, you know, this is, this is also one of those things that, you know, if you are a, a, a particularly a woman in that age range and you're thinking about this vaccine, you're likely to shy away from that vaccine right now. The CDC says people who are experiencing headaches, abdominal or leg pain within three weeks after receiving the shot should contact their doctor. An advisory committee met this week to determine whether the pause on the vaccine should be lifted, but postponed its decision saying more data is needed. COVID vaccinations remain the key to getting life back to normal. Next week on EWTN News In Depth, we take a deep dive into COVID restrictions still impacting our church communities. And we'll hear firsthand what it's like to be hospitalized with COVID and survive to talk about it. A Hong Kong court has sentenced media mogul Jimmy Lai to prison for taking part in a Christian prayer rally in 2019 during the height of pro-democracy marches. More than one and a half million people marched in opposition to a bill that would have allowed suspects to be extradited to mainland China for trial. Nine other prominent activists have also been sentenced up to 18 months in prison for taking part. Lai was sentenced to 14 months. Pope Francis has accepted the resignation of the first bishop investigated under new Vatican guidelines for bishops accused of mishandling clergy sex abuse. Bishop Michael Hepner of Crookston, Minnesota, was the subject of two investigations. They focused on whether he neglected protocols designed to monitor priests accused of misconduct, pressured a victim to drop an abuse allegation, and failed to follow mand mandatory reporting laws. The papal guidelines, known as Vosestis Lux Mundi, allow the Vatican to order an additional investigation into a bishop's conduct after reviewing initial findings. There are more Vosestis investigations now pending in several dioceses in the U.S. The man believed responsible for the biggest fraud in Wall Street history has died behind bars. Bernie Madoff was sentenced to 150 years in prison after the Ponzi scheme he ran was exposed in 2008. The investment guru swindled celebrity investors and institutions out of billions of dollars, wiping out fortunes and ruining charities. Years later, court-appointed trustees are still trying to unwind the scheme to recover money for his investors. Madoff died Wednesday at a prison medical facility. He was 82. Touching and somber moments in the Capitol Rotunda this week, where U.S. Capitol Officer William Evans was honored. The 18-year veteran of the force died after a driver hit him at a barricade outside of the Senate earlier this month. His grieving family looked on as President Biden, members of Congress, and officers paid their respects. The state of California is easing some of its coronavirus public health mandates after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that they violate religious freedom. It's the latest in a series of similar rulings. In this most recent case, the Supreme Court ruled California cannot enforce virus-related limits on home-based religious worship, including Bible studies and prayer meetings. In February, limits on indoor worship capacity were instituted to replace an all-out ban on indoor services. Religious freedom cases are just one of many important items in the news this week about the Supreme Court, not to mention a newly formed presidential commission to study the court and a move by progressive Democrats on Thursday to introduce a court-packing bill. Here to give us a better understanding of these leading topics is Robert Dunn of counsel at the law firm Imer Stahl. He's a former clerk for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and Just Diamond O'Scanlan on the Ninth Circuit. He has litigated religious liberty cases for over a decade. He joins us from San Jose, California. Hi, Rob. Thank you for being with us today. My pleasure, Monse. Good to be here. Congratulations for your big Supreme Court win this week to protect Americans' rights to gather at home for worship. It was one of the most ridiculous uh, rules that I've read about. Tell us about how the state of California was unnecessarily cracking down harder on religious activities than secular activities. Yeah, so the, the gathering ban that we challenged in this case was uh, egregious for a couple reasons. But uh, as you know, California divides counties you know, into tiers. So there's purple tier where the, the virus is really running rampant and then you know red, orange, and yellow. But the gathering guidance 
applied across all tiers, no indoor gatherings at all uh, in a purple tier. And then after that, no more than three households. So if I wanted to host a Bible study in my house, for example, I couldn't have more than two other people over from different households, even if there were zero cases of COVID in the county in which I lived. So it applied across the board. That was that was quite uh, stark. And we you know, recognized until the blueprint, what, what California calls the blueprint is lifted, you will never be able to have a Bible study. And the blueprint has been in place for 10 months now. Um, Newsom has finally, after this court decision, said that it may be lifted in June, but there's been no indication of when that would ever happen. So our, our clients who haven't been able to meet in home to have a Bible study, uh, to have home-based worship, which is a, a really essential part of their faith, they have been banned from doing that for effectively a year, and there was no end in sight. So so we challenged that rule, and what we pointed out is, is yeah, you know, the state has allowed indoor restaurants. It's allowed indoor hair salons. It allows you to ride the bus with 10, 15 other people. Mm-hmm. You can gather You can gather in an airport with 100 people. Right. Uh, you know, so there, there's all manner of sort of activities that the state finds valuable and that it has allowed to ha- occur indoors. Uh, but, but indoor Bible studies was not something that the state thought was valuable, and so it didn't exempt it. The government and that's what here we is, it's choosing winners and losers, right? Tell us a little bit about the importance of religious communities gathering in person and why that's so important for Christians specifically, your clients. Yeah, so one of our clients is a, is a pastor, and he put together a very, in my opinion, powerful declaration at the beginning of our case, laying out how critical it is for Christians to be together face-to-face. As, as he said, you know, every description of the church in the Bible involves people gathering together, you know, laying hands on each other to, to pray, uh, being able to see one another and support one another. Uh, and, you know, and technology is great. You know, we're able to communicate right now, and I'm in San Jose, and you're, you know, back east, but that's not sufficient for, uh, you know, full-fledged Christian worship, uh, especially not not over the course of a year. You know, you, you could maybe do that for a couple of weeks, and they voluntarily did. They didn't challenge the order right away. They, like everybody else, sort of did their part to try to slow the spread. But at some point, you know, the governor has to recognize and the the state has to recognize that religious uh, gatherings are extremely important. They're essential. Uh, That's right. They're essential. They're essential. Yeah. Let's change gears to talking about court packing. Democratic lawmakers introduced legislation to expand the Supreme Court to 13 justices. While House Speaker Nancy Pelosi shot it down, she did say that she supports the Biden administration's commission to analyze reforming the Supreme Court. What do you think the outcome of this will be? Well, I I suspect the outcome will be that they will not uh, increase the number of the Supreme Court. I, I think Cooler heads are going to prevail on that. It's it's got it's riddled with problems. The first being, as soon as you say 13, Republicans get back in power, and it becomes 15 or 17 or 19. It's there there is no stopping that train once you once you decide that nine is no longer a fixed number, and whoever's in power can just alter it. So yeah, I think the Democrats have seen that that has blown up in their face in the past when they you know destroyed the filibuster for lower court nominations, um, and and I suspect they are not going to want to walk down that road um, again. And I think more, more fundamentally, you know, Justice Breyer has even sort of come out forcefully and said this, as had Justice Ginsburg, uh, that as soon as you introduce court packing, it becomes transparent that the court is just a political tool of the party in power. And once that is the case, the court lacks the essential credibility that it needs to do its job. Uh, because as you know, Monte, the, the court doesn't have a police force. Uh, it doesn't pass laws. It doesn't have an army. All it has is its credibility. Uh, when it issues an opinion and, you know, it expects parties to obey it, it expects the government, it expects state governments to obey what it says, uh, it's really, it's the credibility of the court that sort of, that, that compels them to do that. You know, that's there were exactly, calls immediately at, You brought up Justice Breyer, yeah. that's exactly what he said. Um, what about rumors of the demands for him to retire? What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I mean, they they did the same thing with Justice Ginsburg, and it's a decision that Justice Breyer will make on his own. He's not going to be pressured into it. Uh, I've I've met him. He's a delightful man. He's brilliant. And, you know, last I saw him, he was, you know, mentally sharp as a tack. So I don't have any reason to to think that he's going to cave to that kind of pressure, but it's his decision. You know, he he can decide to retire if he wants, but I think uh, throwing pressure on him uh, is going to be counterproductive. I just want to make one comment. Right after this opinion came out, there were several legal academics who urged California to ignore it. Uh, and, and I thought, well, wow, that's 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 a sign of the times right there. 
you know, the, the, Cal the governor is being pressured to ignore a Supreme Court decision. That's right. Because they thought, well, it's too political. And, and as soon as you start court packing, the pressure to do that is going to you know, ramp up exponentially. You're going to have, you know, is Texas going to want to follow uh, a Supreme Court decision that you know, basically slaps down one of its laws? That's right. Uh, you know, you're going to have pressure from every corner. And that's just dangerous. At that point, you know, the Supreme Court has lost its legitimacy. It becomes political rather than principled. Thank you so much, Rob. We hope you'll come back to discuss the Supreme Court again. He escaped a war-torn land and fled into safety. The long faith journey that brought new hope to this Syrian refugee. The civil war in Syria has had a devastating impact on the country. In addition to death and destruction, more than six million Syrians have fled since the conflict began a decade ago. According to the Catholic News Agency, there are now more Syriac Catholics living outside Syria than within, including a Syrian journalist whose faith led him to safety as the bombs exploded. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Alan Holdren has this week's faith journey in depth. Christians have a strong task in Syria. It is to bring peace. Jesus told us to forgive 70 times 7. So if you don't forgive, you are not Christian. Saman Daoud is a Catholic from Syria whose life was upended by war. He and his family are now refugees in Rome, where he works for Radio Maria's Arabic edition. In Syria, he worked as a tour guide, but that was before 2012, when war arrived quite literally to his front door. Two steps from my house was a famous double attack, typical of Al-Qaeda. A car bomb arrives and explodes, people run to help, then a second car bomb arrives and then explodes, creating even more damage. In that one, I lost many of my friends, dear friends, and that's when a greater anger came to me from inside. Overnight, Saman went from happily guiding tourists to guiding war journalists. <laughs> Today, thankfully, the terror of war in Syria is now only present for him in pictures. Here you see a church almost destroyed, and here we go inside the church. Look at the results of the war. Even then, he still wanted to stay in Syria. But in 2015, his son asked him a question that he couldn't answer. When your son tells you that he might be taking soon to do military service, who should I shoot against? And when a missile landed in the Daoud's backyard, that was the final straw. At 45 years old, he, his wife and two children left everything behind and went to Italy, where they were recognized as refugees. Their arrival coincided with Pope Francis' call to all Catholic communities to take in the families taking flight. It was Sunday, September 6, 2015, when the Pope at noon during the Angelus said to open the parishes and welcome refugees. At that hour, at noon, I had landed in Milan. And three days later, Saman received a providential telephone call an invitation from the Holy Father to be a guest at the parish of Santa Marta. For that year, Saman and his family lived in Cardinal Konrad Krajewski's apartment until he found a new job, using his knowledge of journalism. When I first met uh, Saman, I found in him a very uh, fervent person and uh, a very uh, a adequate to, to work here with the radio. When I came here, as I always say, it was for divine providence. When you count on God, God knows what he wants from you. And I always say, the Lord's will be done. 
sia fatta la volontà del Signore. Saman found a way to forgive and move on, keeping his faith and the links to his past and looking forward to his future in Italy with hope. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EWTN News In-Depth. Our thanks to our Vatican Bureau for sharing once again another beautiful story. But our colleagues in Rome aren't quite done. As we close this edition of EWTN News In Depth, we take you to a grotto in Rome on the 74th anniversary of the first reported Marian apparition there. Mary appeared to three children, introducing herself as the Virgin of Revelation. Their father reported many more apparitions over the next 35 years. In 1997, Pope John Paul II approved the naming of the site, the Shrine of Our Lady of the Third Millennium at the Three Fountains. I'm Monse Alvarado. We hope to see you back here same time next week. And as we say goodbye, enjoy the service earlier this week at that shrine in this edition of Images of the Week.